Right, in this video, we will be looking at the beginnings of a rather lengthy unit of aqueous solutions. And um, chapter 8 is going to be something we'll be in for a couple of weeks here. Um, so let's kind of start with the basics in the beginning. And to start, we need to look at, well, what is an aqueous solution? So an aqueous solution is any kind of solution uh, where water is our solvent. And that, for the majority of the things that we do in, in general chemistry, is pretty much every solution. There are very few solutions that we work with that are not aqueous solutions of some kind. Um, it's a really, really common uh, type of uh, medium in which to do chemical reactions. And that's why we're studying it so extensively here in this chapter. Now, aqueous solutions fall into two categories based on the solute, based on the substance that is being dissolved. And the two categories are electrolytes, that is solutions that will conduct electricity, and non-electrolytes, substances, solutions that do not conduct electricity. Now, let's look at each one of those in turn. Electrolytes. Again, substances, solutions that are capable of conducting electricity. And this conductance comes as a result of when we dissolve that solute in water, not only does it dissolve, but the solute begins to split into ions as they dissolve. And so there are certain types of materials that are capable of doing this. They fall into three categories. There are your salts. That is your ionic compounds that when they dissolve in water will break apart into their subsequent ions. There are acids and then there are bases. Now as far as electrolytes are concerned, we can classify them and break them into one of two categories. We have the strong electrolytes, that is the substances that conduct electricity very well. And then we have the weak electrolytes, the ones that conduct electricity poorly. Now, the thing to recognize about the weak electrolytes is that even they, though they do conduct electricity poorly, it's important to note that they still do conduct electricity. Um, and that's an important feature of them. Now, when we look at strong electrolytes, what we find if we break down the solution to the molecular level is we find something, a phenomenon known as complete dissociation. So dissociation is when that ionic crystal breaks into pieces. Strong electrolytes have what are known as complete dissociation. So every single sodium chloride crystal breaks up into sodium ions and chloride ions. We get 100% conversion. Weak electrolytes, on the other hand, are classified by what we would call partial dissociation in water. That is, the substance in question, in this case we're looking at acetic acid, doesn't completely break down in water. In fact, only breaks down partially in water. So we tend to think of these reactions as reversible, where the reaction can happen in one direction where acetic acid can break apart into its ions but we can also think about those ions breaking coming back together to reform the acetic acid that is um, that it was started with and in those kinds of scenarios what we tend to see is that about on average 96 percent or so of the acetic acid molecules actually stay molecules and only about four percent of those molecules actually dissociate and form ions and so we can see now why they conduct electricity so differently from each other here we've got a lot of ions present in solution since we have a lot of ions present we're going to conduct electricity quite well and here we have few ions in solution so we're still going to be able to stabilize that charge but not nearly as well as this one was. Now, what kinds of things qualify as strong electrolytes? 
Well, we have to look at ionic compounds. Even if I have an insoluble salt or something that is relatively insoluble, when it does dissolve, it completely dissociates. So any ionic compound that is capable of dissolving dissolves as a strong electrolyte. And also in here are strong bases and strong acids. Now, what kinds of materials actually qualify in the weak electrolyte category? Well, ionic compounds aren't going to be in here. The only things that are going to be in here are weak acids and weak bases, things that will coexist in that equilibrium state with their dissociated ions. And so we see that double-sided reaction, that reversible reaction taking place where the form reaction takes place and the molecule dissociates. And then the reverse reaction also is capable of taking place where the ions come back together to reform the molecule. And as a result, we don't have a whole lot of ions present. We have some, but not a whole lot. Now, what about non-electrolytes? What qualifies as a non-electrolyte? Well, non-electrolytes are substances where we don't have any ionization occurring. We don't have any conductivity of electricity. And where we tend to see this the most often with aqueous solutions are aqueous solutions of polar organic materials. So things like sugar. Sugar is a polar organic material. So its polarity allows it to dissolve in water but the covalent bonds inside of sugar are just too strong for the water to overcome to break it apart into ions. Same thing with ethanol. Same thing with the ethylene glycol. Um, we find that those substances do not conduct electricity whatsoever. And in the case of solid ionic compounds, we find the same kind of issue because even though we have lots of ions here, those ions are incapable of moving because they are locked in the crystal structure itself. Now, so for conductivity, not only do we have to have particles that are charged, we have to have an ability for those charged particles to move. And in an ionic crystal, they're locked in place. They can't do it. So you may be asking yourself, okay, well, how do I start to recognize these kinds of materials? And for that, we have to have a good link into some solubility rules. So I'm going to have you do a post-lecture activity that's going to help you to identify strong acids and strong bases and, and tell them apart from each other. But in terms of ionic compounds, it's a little bit more difficult to kind of reason through. For strong acids and strong bases, you know, there's a list of each of them that's relatively finite. There's seven strong acids that you have to know. So if you can recognize that an acid is present and it's not one of the seven strong acids, then you know it's a weak acid. And for the strong bases, there are several strong bases. They're all related to position on the periodic table. Basically, it's hydroxides of all the alkali metals, the group one hydroxides, and then all of the heavy group two hydroxides, starting with calcium and working your way down the periodic table toward barium. So those are your strong bases. So if you recognize a hydroxide that's not one of those, again, you know that it's not strong base, so it must be a weak base. But for ionic compounds, it's a little bit more difficult to kind of wrap your head around. Now, luckily, there are some rules that we can follow. And the rules here are kind of in tiers, um, kind of like uh, layers on a birthday cake. And so what we can think about with regard to those tiers is that there is a group of rules that are always soluble. And so if it's anything on here, it doesn't matter what else is written up here. This is the foundation applies. So we've got a group of rules that are ions that are always soluble. And so it doesn't matter what you put it with. If it's got one of those ions on it, it's going to be soluble. We've got a group that is usually soluble. 
what we find in this group is that there are some exceptions. And then in this group here, we have the usually insolubles. And there are some exceptions in here, but most of the exceptions here kind of trickle their way down through the other two. So let's take a look at those. In the usually soluble camp, you have really common ions. And you can see now, because of these, why most of the solutions in your lab feature one or more of these ions. Because it's really easy to make solutions of any of these because we know they'll dissolve. So nitrates. Nitrates are always soluble. Acetates, always soluble. Your alkali metal, your group 1 ions, always soluble. So that's your lithium, your sodium, your potassium. Ammonium ion, always soluble. Chlorate ions, perchlorate ions, always soluble. So if you identify a compound that has one of these ions in it, you can automatically circle it and know it's going to dissolve. It's a, not only is it going to dissolve, it is going to completely dissociate when it does. Now, in that second tier, the ones that are usually soluble, in here we've got a couple of groups. So your halides, in particular your chlorides, bromides, and iodides, these are usually soluble. Pair them with most things and they will dissolve. But there are three notable exceptions to this rule. They are the silver compounds, the mercury-1 compounds, and again, with mercury-1, uh, this is probably the trickiest ion on your ions page. We are dealing with mercury-2+, plus, but two mercury atoms, two, so mercury-2, two, 2+. Two plus. That's what a mercury-1 atom or ion is. And so your mercury-1 compounds and your lead compounds, all of those are exceptions to the rules. Other in this group is sulfates. Now sulfates for the most part are soluble. Sodium sulfate, soluble. Copper-2 sulfate, soluble. Where we get into exceptions are in some of our heavy group 2 um, uh, alkaline earth metals, so your calcium, your strontium, your barium, but also mercury 1 and lead show up here as well. So notice that in both of these scenarios, we had exceptions associated with mercury 1 and lead. Mercury 1 and lead. So mercury 1 and lead are two of the really common uh, substitutions, or really common exceptions to this rule. The final group here are the ones that are usually insoluble. Now, the reason we list these out here are because these are the ones that have the biggest group of exceptions. So sulfides, sulfides are usually insoluble um, and they usually smell horrible um, uh, as they uh, react. The exceptions here are ammonium, alkali metals and alkaline earth metals. So ammonium and alkali metals, you should have expected that anyway, that they were in the group, uh, the first group, the always soluble group. Same thing for hydroxides. We see the same group of exceptions with the hydroxides. Um, these other ones here, and really any other ion that is on this, that's not on this list. So you've got your chromates and your oxalates, your phosphates, your carbonates, but if we throw anything else at you, arsenates or um, you know, really anything, if it's not on this list specifically, it doesn't have any other funky exceptions. You can use the always soluble cation list and just take it from there. So this list of solubility rules, this is going to be what is prominently featured in proficiency number five. So use this time to really start preparing for that proficiency. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me uh, any way that you can. I'll be happy to help you uh, get over the hump there. Have a good day.